Yeah. 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 Better give than receive. <laughs> <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> Any others? I know there's probably a lot of unspoken. We'll lift those up. Let's go. Yes, ma'am. Let's go, Lord, in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, just want to thank you for, for allowing us to, to be together just to learn more about you. And I want to lift up these spoken and unspoken prayer requests between Betsy and Michelle and and, and their medical issues, and uh, we know you're the great physician, and I want to praise you for that, uh, for what you've done in my life, and also the many unspoken prayer requests. I know everyone here probably has some unspoken laid upon their heart, and we lift those up to you as well. Now, just uh, be with this service. Open our hearts and our minds and our ears so we can hear what Brother Gary has to say, and let those words flow out of his mouth come from your mouth into his. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. We got a birthday boy here. Yeah, we do. Mm -hmm. And a birthday couple. Who's in there, Mercy? Yesterday was birthday and anniversary. I think Eric technically was right. Joe's anniversary? <laughs> All right. Garrett's birthday. Well, Jim Bull saying stand up and sing for y'all, we can take and start off that way. It's all on Jim Bull, y'all. <laughs> but uh, we're gonna do it kind of different today. Um, Michelle, she she had all intentions to come this morning, get the music. She had a rough night last night, so uh, it was kind of funny how everything played out. But uh, anyway. I think we're going to do it a different kind of way. There will be a song in the middle of the message. I think is the biggest reason why things turned out the way it did today. We got several out. Marcus and Darla, they went to Mountain View, I believe, uh, with their granddaddy today. So just pray for them. But uh, it's been going on for about a week. The Lord revealing stuff, showing stuff, and just kind of um, laying some stuff on my heart. You know, we as a church body, we come together and, uh, you know, uh, we're all a piece of God's puzzle. And God takes a piece away, he'll put a piece in. And I think God's working some amazing stuff in my life outside of church and in this church. So with that kind of being said, I'm going to go over with some stuff that I had to deal with this week kind of show you where we're at. Um, Brother Billy even said something about it a little bit earlier. When we stop and look at the world the way it really is, how's the world in general look to you in your eyes? As a whole. Somebody? Corrupt. Corrupt. What is certain level of hell? certain level of hell. Then why is there people out there talking about how peace, look at the good, look at the good. That, is that kind of a deception tactic to take us off to realize? I know if I was in a war, and the enemy got me surrounded, and they just zinging past my head, and we're all saying, hey, who's great, y'all? Huh? Well, the devil has a way to get our eyes all focus and if we look at the situation and how the world is and that kind of tells you where we're at in the church timeline, right or wrong? Right. So the devil knows his time is about up because it says Jesus even tells us or God does. It says back in the days of Noah, you know, they was marrying, they was having a good time, they was going to work. They they, they didn't see what was going on. And, and you know, here's the amazing thing for 120 years Noah was building this ark that had never rained before and nobody really gave a concern of what was going on around them. How do we know that nobody in the world cared? Who got on the ark? Noah and his family. Noah and his family. Nobody else. Nobody else. So with that kind of being said, we can look back at that and kind of see where we're at. I had a talk with a young person the other day. Parents, I'm telling you something. 
You can teach your kids all you want to about Jesus and who he was, but that will never lead them to salvation. You know, God saves, Jesus saves. It's our job to give them an understanding. You can't coax anybody into heaven. The Holy Spirit has to come up on that person to make them realize they're a sinner in need of God's grace, and you accept that. It can't be taught. It can't be. It, it happens with the Holy Spirit in that individual. And, and when this young person started telling me, and, and I started asking questions back, I said, how do you know that? And he said, well, I learned that. There's a big difference. <coughs> and I think that's a, a, an issue in churches today, too. When the Holy Spirit comes in you, a transformation starts at that time. If you've taught who Jesus is, there's no transformation going to happen. None whatsoever. None whatsoever. Now, let's take a look at the world's eyes. You know, uh, matter of fact, I'll put down a, I'll be using the phones on today. But I wrote this the other day on Facebook. How many here believe God reveals things to people? Man, first one raises his hand. I got news for you. God's light will always shed the light on darkness. He will expose that darkness. I'm going to tell you something. A reason a lot of people don't come to church is because a lot of church people are judgmental. And this is something the Lord's worked on me all week, and then something happened yesterday that really, really blew my mind. That's not, that's not the church that Jesus died for. That is a religious person casting judgment on somebody that has no right to judge nobody. Make sense? Now the Bible tells us by their fruits you shall know them and all that. Guess what? Here's redneck saying. Actions speak louder than words. You can claim Christ all you want to, but how you live, how you act, how you love people, how you care for people. Guess what? That tells a true story. Make sense? So the other day when all this is going on, and this is kind of a God putting me through something maybe to give something to you because maybe you're going through something together or completely different. But I said, religious people cannot see past their judgmental nose much like the Pharisees did Jesus. That makes sense? Yeah. So when we go back and look at the Pharisees, they was the religious leaders. They just want all dressed up, one did all, you know, the religious things. And, um, and, that here, here's Jesus right in front of them. They were so focused on God and religion that they look right past the Savior. See, there's a lot of people come to church that knows Jesus as Lord or Savior, but they do not know him as Lord. See, a true disciple, a true follower of Jesus Christ submits his life to him. Here you go, God. Use me. Now, we're all going to have our jobs. We're all going to be wrapped, <coughs> excuse me, wrapped up in our own way of life. But the whole purpose of your being is living for Jesus. The Holy Spirit uses through you. And you know what? I know something's going to happen because the devil is just constantly, constantly trying to beat a lot of brothers down. I had a brother called that I hadn't talked to in three years. And uh, he, he and I kind of figured something happened. When it hit me yesterday, take time to give him a call. Big church member, big ball in the youth group, and this and that. Well, guess what? He lost focus and got caught up in some stuff, and it wasn't good. He told me, he said, brother, and, and it's kind of funny because I have eye issues. My eye stays very constantly. It bothers me all the time. And he had stomach issues. He said, God put my stomach issues, so, put me in so much pain to make me realize I needed to come back to him. He said, everything's good now. I see too many people that I know are warriors for God that the devil is attacking left and right because he knows his time's up. He knows his time's up. And I'll be perfectly honest with you. I'm going to pray for a religious people, person. 
I will talk to a religious person, or I will not. They have to change themselves, and the Holy Spirit's the only one going to be able to change them. And here in a little bit, we're going to see a video. One of the greatest spiritual awakenings in the United States of America ever. And a lot of people don't know this because a lot of people don't want to talk about this. It was in the 60s, the hippies. Sex, drugs, love, rock and roll, and all this stuff. These, these group of people was looking for something but the church shut the doors. They didn't want nothing to do with those people, they called them. Those people. You know what? I've been to churches where this is how they address a person addicted. Those people. What's those people? It, it never makes no sense to me. And this is where me and the religious church, church, has a big disagreement that people don't want to accept who I am or who you are or what we do. But uh, can we play? This is a movie. It's called G. It's based on a true story. I've done the background, knew about it. What's come <coughs> out has really blew my mind this week for the, how many times it jumped up at me. Well, then I heard something yesterday come out of the mouth of a so-called Christian that really put this in perspective of who God's church really is. See, Jesus is the head of the church, right or wrong? Not me, not you. You don't decide who comes in here and who don't come in here. We're supposed to be about love and helping people to the, to the cross, so to speak, uh, to find Jesus. Well, this right here explains a whole lot, and it kind of sets up the message. <laughs> hey, Square. I am not a square. I think we should invite Greg this weekend. What's this weekend? These people are hippies, rebels against old fashioned authority. I think these kids need help. The neighbors are bad. You're passing judgment on people you know nothing about. And maybe that's why your church is so empty. When John walks in here, brings me a hippie. I'll ask him what it's all about. Because I did not understand. This house has a very good vibe. There is an entire generation searching. Slow down, baby, slow down. Just in all the wrong places. If you want to reach my people, you need to speak to them in a language they understand. If I bring them in, I'm going to lose my job. We can only walk through doors open to us in your church. That's a door that's shut. Probably notice we have some guests here today. I'd like you to meet my new friends. Welcome. They don't belong here. Half of them are wearing shoes. They're staining in the new shag carpet. They need our help. If you feel like you're misunderstood and judged, you will find forgiveness and freedom right here. That was awesome. Now that door is open any time of day. And if there are some who don't like that, well then, that door works both ways. All right, Pastor, let's begin. I was most done with this, but then you did with nobody else for you in there. This thing that we found, I feel like I belong. You're going to need a bigger church. Our country is a dark and divided place, but now there's hope and it's spreading. This is your home. I don't want you to tell all your friends about it. Okay. I'm not promoting that movie, but I am saying that church needs to be like that, right or wrong. Amen. Amen. So when we sit there and look at the 60s and what that time frame's about, what's 2023 like for these young people? Yeah, just give me some. It's a mix. This this culture in 2023 is such a mixed bag of sin and sinful lifestyles and sinful choices. And there's so many commercials that are forcing us into acceptance of that into the into um into the culture, into our walkway, into our journey, that um, offering 
offering that love is paramount to reach those those different types of yeah. things. Yeah. It, did you notice when they was talking about staining their shag carpet, what was the pastor doing? Washing their feet. Washing their feet. And you know, Jesus gave an example of that. But, but you know, the only times I've ever seen that happen was here, so a few years ago. But he sat there and watched each one of his feet. He, 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 and what really got me was, did you notice how most dead that church was? You see how the Holy Spirit come up on him and opened the doors for these, those people. Then all of a sudden his heart started changing and he brought them in. And I love the part when he says, oh yeah, and the door opens both ways. But you can do the research and see and some of you, you know, people's going to have nay or say about anybody. But have anybody ever heard of Greg Lowry, the preacher evangelist? He was part of that movement. And, and, you know, I'm not, like I say, I'm not saying promoting that movie or whatnot, but I do believe those that follow Jesus Christ don't see boundaries like that and, and say, no, uh -uh. I ain't have no part of that. I, I, I'm never going to agree with it. Never. And, and, you know, the amazing part about it, I know it's going to be real with you this morning. Every time we come to church, the devil's here somewhere. Y'all heard me say that? And say that, and I will always say that. And not everybody here, Brother Billy talked about this morning, not everybody that comes to church on Sunday morning is a true convert. They know who Jesus is, and they try to walk a certain way, act a certain way, but they have no relationship with him, and therefore they never change from the inside out to accept people like that. So that's the problem I got. Seems like God calls me to people like that. See, I went and put the handicap ramp in for the, the young man that, uh, that, that was wanting to come to church. He, he'd been bedridden his whole life, and, and he's wanting to come to church. So right after that, I got a call and had to go. To, and this was Friday when I had somebody watching Michelle, and I went somewhere else. Well, guess what? It, it, it's the same kind of person. But we're all people. And, and you know, God didn't come here to save those that come to church and want to act religious. I'm just telling you that. Because a, a religious person do not know Jesus Christ. I don't care how much they study that Bible. Until Jesus gets a hold of your heart and starts changing it from inside out, there is nothing. It's easy to see people struggling right or wrong. Why do people worry? Why do people gossip? Why do people try to do good and cover it up? Why do people do good and want to show it out? And here, here, here's the bad part about where we're, where we're at in our society today. Now stop and think about this. A lot of people, you know, I was blessed with strong home, my kids was. So many today come from broke, broken homes, fatherless, abuse, addiction, love, and love is rarely shown. We as a church must provide that family, that bond, that love. The family will accept anyone to help them and support them. When we talk about family, I'm talking about God's, the church. To make them feel worthy. You realize how many people that's walking around using drugs, sex, alcohol, they just don't feel worthy? So we, we, we kind of on a rescue mission, but before we help fix people, we got to find the problem, and that brokenness is caused by sin. Yeah. But, but sometimes we kind of want to puff ourselves up. And I, I, I'll be honest with you, I'm getting tired of religious zealots. Just damn. And people say, well, you shouldn't be that way, brother. Was, was Jesus? Look at Jesus, how he handled the Pharisees. Snakes, vipers. Boy, he caught hypocrites. It says, Jesus gave his life for this family of the church. The love of Christ can be seen by those who grow up without that love. 
One thing I can say about this church, I've had people come in and say, man, I ain't ever felt so welcome in this place in my life. You feel love when you come indoors. Well, we should be doing, but we need to extend that outside. One reason I say that is, if we keep it to ourselves and the church don't multiply, there's a problem. There's a problem. And it's kind of like a rally crowd today, so to speak. You know, you can preach and preach. If you ever talk to somebody and just never sinks in, it, <laughs> Jesus said, if they don't want to grasp the gospel message, shake the dust off your feet. Yep. So, we can look at that. We as a church should be on a rescue mission for such. Just a simple five minute conversation with someone can turn someone around and lead them to Jesus. But we can't find five minutes. <coughs> Okay, do five minutes. See, I really feel like calling out people, but I can't do that. I'll preach for and I'll preach against. A religious person <laughs> never going to get to heaven. Why? Because they're counting on their good works, their good deeds, their study and all that. When you don't see a person changing from inside out. Hey, like Brother Billy said this morning with his a Bible study lesson. He he had his hands, it was a heart, and he had a piece of paper hanging down. You know what? Once you're saved, ain't nobody going to take you out of God's hands. But you know what? Satan can pull you almost out to get you out of God's will, not to do the things God wants to do. And a lot of people that call themselves Christians struggle because you don't look at yourself in the mirror and say, Show me what I need to change, God. What I need, what I, I need strength. I need wisdom. I need all this. I go back to Max, and I'll say this for a guy that just got saved and baptized in September to deliver something like this. God has showed him shows me that the Holy Spirit is educating Max because he's smarter than people I know been in church for twenty years. He had a heart to find out what God wanted in his life. A lot of people, I'm saved. The only thing I need to do is go to church. That's a problem. That's the reason why. That's the reason why we're in this situation in this country. But look at that. Look how that turned around. Let's look at this. Look at nine nine eleven. The churches was full the next Sunday, but gradually they went away. Amazing thing about it, I, I felt like the Lord was leading me to study Ezekiel, Daniel, and Jeremiah. Every one of them had a message of warning. Hey, turn around, repent, get yourself right with God, and guess what? Bondage is coming your way. You know what? I think that's coming anyway, but there's people outside this church that needed love and a conversation about who Jesus is. The cool part about that is they wasn't no Bible, Bible thumpers involved in that movement, movement. It was people that the Holy Spirit was just coming over and showing them. And that tur- turned turned a lot of those young people to, to warriors for Jesus where a lot of them kept going the same, down the same path. It's not going to change everybody. But the... <coughs> Let's just picture ourselves as night going through the woods. You had a flashlight, and you shine that flashlight, and you see two eyes going back at you. The only thing you can see is the eyes. What do you think it would be? Wouldn't have a clue, would it? So how are we going to be able to tell what animal that eyes is. Huh? Go to. Go to. The more light that shines on those eyes reveals what kind of animal that is, right? Look at it this way. The light of Jesus shines on people's hearts the same way to where you can tell what that person is. The amazing thing about that, God gives that wisdom and knowledge and spiritual vision to those that, that want that, to see that, to be aware of that. 
Now let's let's just say we take these young people and put them up there on that playground, and there's four rattlesnakes up there. We're gonna say, "Hey, go on up there, and you know, don't worry about nothing, have a good time." Or we're gonna go move the snakes. You see what I'm saying? When God's word, He don't say remove the snakes. He said, let it grow together. He said, because if you try to pull up the weeds, guess what? You'll pull up the wheat. He'll do the separating in the end. But I guess where all that comes is this. I want to be at the church, and we are for the biggest part. And I don't want to lose focus of what this church is all about. I can't help the other churches. They do, you know, and I trust they're in God's will. But this church, I want it to stay more open to reach people like that that way. Does that make sense? Because to me, that's the true church. That's what it's all about. Yes, people make mistakes. Yes, people cause them their own faults. But guess what? Those that don't want to help themselves, we can't help anyway. Because if a person don't want to change, they're never going to change. But we just don't look at them and say, well, they do it to yourself. Walk off. Funny thing I'm finding out, the ones that become the true warriors of Jesus Christ are those same kind of people. Those same kind of people. And you know, hope, hopefully, that kind of Steers in the direction. The message the Lord prepared today, which He really laid that on my heart, uh, is is something I think that uh, it should make us feel very, very good when we leave, leave leave this church, and it should make us very, very motivated to go out and be the church. But before I get to there, I get this: it says. People who encounter the risen Christ are totally transformed. Their outlook on life is altered forever. Staying true to their faith, they do not hesitate to face hardship, persecution, and even death. Many consecrate their lives to serve others, minimizing their own needs and desires. And that kind of and the part one. Part two? Hey, glad you're here today. Glad you're here today. And uh, just remember to lift up Sister Betsy and uh, Michelle and those that haven't said anything. Uh, but uh, let's pray for the church too. Uh, just pray for it. Pray for the people in the church. Oh. Uh, some of you heard this before, some of you hadn't. When I first got into the ministry, I remember, in fact, Tammy went up there several times. Uh, a dear brother of mine, he's passed away, uh, Brother Emmett Sexton. He asked me to do a jail ministry in Montgomery County, and I did that for 14 months. And kind of how it was set up, you go in, preach the first group, you know, the shoplifters, the, the petty smaller crimes and first of word. And then the medium sized uh, next group, you know, they was, you know, in jail for drugs and salt and stuff like that. Well, the third group, most of those consisted of guys that was going to life in prison or some even on death row. And I never will forget this one guy and I've shared this testimony before. Uh, he's a great big guy, uh, dreadlocks, Tears coming down his face, uh, tattooed. And the first day I was there, when I recognized he was there, that dude was staring hold just like by staring at Shane like he is in the back. I was like, that dude won't get a picture of me. So they had a bell set right there. Second time, uh, second month, come in, and he was sitting right back. Pretty close to where Shane was at. One reason I picked Shane out. <laughs> That dude was just doing this again. When the Lord spoke to me, he said, you stare at him down. 
That's what I did the whole time I was preaching. I was looking right at him. The third month I went up there, this old boy cracked. Didn't have a chance to ask him, you know, what really happened because he really wasn't supposed to touch me. He wasn't even really supposed to get close to him, but I had shook everyone that come through there. And then there was a ladies group every once in a while. And I don't forget this dude come up to me. He was cut like Atlas. And he looked at me and he goes, you know, so-and-so and so-and-so. And I was like, yeah, brother, I sure do. He said he was a straight up dude. I appreciate you come talking with me. And off we went. But I've thought about him a million times if God got a hold of him or if he did that day or maybe he had him before. But 75%, they say, that was in that jail was born again Christians. That really opened my eyes of how Satan uses God's people to get them off track. But the biggest part is, do we realize that at one time we was on death row? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> heading to a sinner's hell with no way out? And you may be heading down death's road today where there's going to be no way out. There ain't but one way you're going to escape that. Just one way, and that's through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you. We just want to lift up your word this morning, dear Father God. And I know we're doing some of a different kind of way today. and Just lead you, God, and direct me to, to speak that uh, our hearts and minds and ears be open. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Mm -hmm. You will turn your Bible to Luke chapter 23. And we kind of went over this not too long ago. But I think it's one of the coolest verses or passages in the Bible. Uh, but we're going to look at three men on death row that day. One died for you. Jesus died for you. He's on death row. He was hanging on that cross. One thief on the right hand side. Guess what? He's on death row. He's going to die there. Guess what? He chose to mock and criticize Christ. Well, the thief on the left hand side chose to believe and put his faith and trust in him. Jesus says, I'll be with you today in paradise. So let's look at uh, Luke 23 verses 38. And it says, there was written notice above him, which read, this is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals, criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence. We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said to Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, I tell you the truth, today you will be with me in paradise. You, you, you know, when we sit here and just stop and think about that just a second, I thought Brother Billy said it this morning. Go back to the time when you think you got saved. Go back to that day. What really happened? Do you not realize that if you it would have got killed five minutes later, you'd have been on death row to a place called hell that churches don't like to talk about today because it's unpleasant. But guess what? That's where we was all at. And a lot of people don't believe in that to this day. There are some professing Christians that do not believe God sends people to hell. Guess what? God does not send people to hell in a kind of a way he does, but he gives you a way out. Believe in his son Jesus and you'll escape that death row sentence. He paid it off. It's not about our good deeds and our good works we do in church. And here's what I get. And we've been kind of talking about this, and I think God's really focusing on our church because I truly believe, I know this, God's fixing to do something very big, and I hope it's right here at this church. There's other stuff going on. There's a lot of stuff going on in my life. I know for a fact God's fixing to do something very big with those to submit to him. Now, 
I don't know about you. I hope you're not one of those that says, well, you know what? I'm, I'm good enough going to heaven. You know what? A lot of Bible scholars call you the most pitiful of all people. Why is that? They say that today, the typical Christian is only looking at what they can get on this earth through materialism, through wealth. They look at what they got to do here on earth versus what they got to do in heaven. Their focus is never really on the kingdom of God and the future and the living for eternity. Their whole focus of being is working and living for this time on earth. They call them wretched and pitiful. Think about that. No wonder so many Christians is unhappy. No wonder so many has got bad attitudes and no joy and no no fire. I met some friends Thursday that was talking about going uh, on another motorcycle ride, and we we walked into the place, and, and guess what? They had the music going and people laughing, joking, and cutting up. Guess what? We Christians can do the same thing without all the other stuff. Where's the attitude? Where's the joy? Where's the excitement of being a Christian? I'm just being honest with you. I, I'm searching for it. I'm going to be honest with you. I'm looking for that. Because I want that. See, God gives you the desires of your heart. A lot of people don't understand that. Each one of us have a journey to live. It might be different. It's going to be different than mine. It's going to be different than the person sitting next to you. It's going to be different than the person in the back. But guess what? Each one of us have a journey to live, and our life is to live for him. He'll supply everything else. A lot of times I feel like the Lord trying to nudge me for some reason. So when we sit here and look at this, I don't know about you, but I thank God for Jesus dying on that cross. I, I, I let my own self get beat down. Why? Because of what people talk to me about. I'm like, good God. Seriously. I'm not saying, hey, don't call them. You know, I'm very open 24-7, but hey, let's hear some good news, too. I'm going to be honest with you. The news I get, the devil's winning. But the news that I know out of there, God's already won. Amen. So we need to start living like we've already won. Amen. I'm just being serious. Yeah, I got a heart and it's got 55 on it, but I can't do that. When you tap into the same Jesus I know, he's going to fill you with what you need to overcome anything you got. Now, if you want to wallow in the slop, wallow in the slop. Kind of goes back to the prodigal son. The prodigal son was out here running and living in the world. Guess what? He found out at his daddy's house, God the Father was a whole lot better. And God the Father runs to the son and welcomed him back. Guess what? There's a lot of people doing that same thing that never make it back. Me. Let's turn to First Timothy uh, chapter one. All right, let's look at something. You may be sitting here and saying, "Hey, what's my purpose? What's my purpose? What's God's will? I don't know." You're never going to find out until you start doing the first things first. Submit. Submit your whole self. If we could really see into our hearts how many people in church house today truly love God with all their heart, mind, body, and soul. With all their heart, mind, body, and soul. Then we can start to see why some don't change. You see what I'm saying? Then the second thing is love your neighbor more than you say. So let's look at this scripture right here. What's our purpose? 
In 1 Timothy chapter 1, starting at verse 12, listen to this, if you can pick up on it. I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who has given me strength, that he considered me faithful, appointing me to his service. Even though I was once a blasphemer and persecutor and a violent man, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Verse 15. Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason, I was shown mercy so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his unlimited patience and an example for those who would believe on him and receive eternal life. What's part of that purpose that we got? What's Paul's purpose? What was Jesus' purpose? Somebody tell me. Verse 15. Huh? To glorify God. Glorify God. Look right here. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Think about that. He didn't come here to build big churches. He didn't come here to 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 put in a new church or whatever it is, he came here to save sinners. Now, I want to point something out to you. If our purpose is to save sinners, leading people to Christ, God he might give us a new church. But it, I'll tell you one thing, he's going to give us a new heart, <laughs> a brighter heart, a stronger heart, a heart of love. we got to practice love, folks, or you fall out of love. I'm just telling you. I'm just telling you. It, it, you know, I never will forget, I, before I... Before, or I went to coach football as a man in this county that I respected a whole lot. He told me something. He said, I'm going to tell you right now, you're going to learn to hate them. I was like, learn to hate who? Well, then he told me. I was like, why now? Well, I never will forget about that third year going into it. I remember what he said. Why? Because I was drifting for hating some. Not maybe hate, but very much dislike some. Then I had to get my heart back. I had to step back and go, hey, I can't be like that. You see what I'm saying? Now, we all get to that point in time, right? Where life just shakes us up. We get bitter. We get angry. I was reading, reading in the Bible last night because I've been able to read a whole lot since Michelle's been sick. But I, it, I can't get over this. We got people in the church, even this church, that sometimes get aggravated or disagreement with somebody over here. Instead of taking care of the issue the way Jesus takes care of the issue, they just let it boil. They let it get worse. And the Bible, he says, if you realize that you got something against your brother, go square away your knees, but then come to that altar. But if you're at that altar, remember that you have something against your brother, you're supposed to go take care of that. But you know what? We got people in the church houses all across the country, I'm sure today, that's got something against somebody over across the aisle or in front or in back. And, and they, they decided it's a buffet and they don't want to listen to that part. I'm going to tell you something right now. Listen up, church. Jesus is all about unity. There ain't one person that sows division, and that's the devil himself. Yeah. When people run around behind the back planting seeds of doubt and discord, guess what? The devil's got on that person. I'm not saying if they're unsaved or going to hell, but that's a prime example of how the devil works in God's house. Be aware of that. Never forget that. But our job, our purpose, is just like Jesus. A lot of people say we're saved to serve. Yeah, we're saved to serve, but it ain't talking about birthday cake every Sunday. It ain't talking about cleaning the toilet. We're saved to serve the king. The king's mission was to go out and seek and baptize and train, make disciples. 
Y'all know that's a rule of thumb here that comes out my mouth constantly, but guess what? A lot of times I think we get preoccupied with what's going on and then we kind of forget what it's all about. It's like David's creek. He's down at the creek leading people to Jesus. Hey, I'm all about that. It, it, if you're out at a picnic or work or riding a Harley or doing whatever you do, hey, it's open field. We don't pick and choose what we do. Lord kind of hit me with something this morning. I pulled in Dyer's Creek just looking at the water for a little bit, kind of collect my thoughts. And there's an elderly man walking toward me, and I'd seen him before. God done already turned and got on 79 and hit the church, and I go, well, why don't I stop and say something like this? My mind was preoccupied with this service this morning. Y'all follow me? <coughs> now, here's, here's the amazing thing about this. A lot of times people have to up. I'm going to give you some insights. When you go to the doctor, uh, whether it's cancer, torn ligament, or uh, ACL, the doctor's going to diagnose the problem, and he's going to go about a solution to fix the problem. Well, a lot of times people get puffed up. They want it done their way. Why do you think all the messages in the past have been done about narcissistic personalities and all this? It's all about self. you got to get rid of self before you ever get right with Jesus Christ. Yeah. That's just a straight-up bottom line fact. You deny yourself, take up your cross daily, and follow him. But if we sit here and look, Romans 3, 23, it says, For all sinners have what? Sin and fall short of the glory of God. That's every one of us. Every man, woman, and child that has been born, guess what? We're sinners. Now, a child has an agent of accountability. What that is? That's between God and that child and the understanding of that child or whatnot. But comes a point in time when they realize that, hey, you know what? I messed up. First time you get caught in the line, you feel guilty. Guess what? You're old enough. So that's right there. We should be puffed up about that. It says right here, as it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. You know what? We're still that way. We're still that way. The only way we're deemed righteous is because we were redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ and him on the cross. So there's no room for pride and arrogance and lifting yourself up to say, hey, I, I just ain't going to be around those people. Now let's look at John 3.16. John 3.16, and we're getting closer to the end. We've talked about this here before. But here, here's the gospel message. You know, if you're there talking about somebody, Jesus Christ, this is perfect. This is perfect to share them. You know what? It don't matter if you sitting here going, hey, if you're lost and you're a sinner, you're going to spend eternity in hell. You know what? There's people out there that don't know who Jesus is, don't know what hell's all about. Well, guess what? Hell's one of the worst places you're ever going to get thrown. Imagine yourself thrown in a furnace incinerator that's going to burn at 5,000 degrees, and that's your place that you're spiritually going to live forever because guess what? That's God's wrath on that center. Look what he did to Jesus on the cross. That hell, guess what? He's telling us, this is where I'm sending you if you deny me. And it gets worse. It gets worse. People don't want to talk about hell. Why? Because it freaks them out. They don't want to face it. We get John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his, only, gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Now, let's stop and look at that right there. First of all, before a person becomes saved, he needs to realize that they're sheep. He needs to realize that he's a sinner heading to that place. What's a good way to do that? The Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not covet. Guess what? That's the God's holy law. Those ten, <laughs> those ten commandments still apply today because that makes me look at it and go, you know what? I can't do that. I can't do that. There's no way you can do that. 
Jesus is the only one who ever did do that. He didn't come to abolish the law. He came to fulfill the law. That's the reason why Jesus gets us into heaven. Then it says right here, verse 17, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. There's the world's way out. His Son. <coughs> Whoever believes in him is not condemned. Now, I'm going to be perfectly honest with you. It's a little more belief than believing in uh, the two fairy and the bunny rabbit and all this other stuff. That type of belief takes over its roots and it just grows into you. So listen to this. But whoever does not believe stands condemned already because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. He's telling you right there. He said, I'm, I'm giving you a tick like Brother Billy said this morning. Here's your ticket to get out of that place. But you got to come get the ticket. You know what I found out is? I, I get calls all types of night. But I'm to the point with several, I say, hey, brother, if you want something, come see me. Because as long as I keep running to them, they ain't changing. They expect me to be there. Brother, be here next week. Uh-uh. Change the tactics. You're going to come see me. You know why? Because if they really want change, they're going to get up and come see you. You see what I'm saying? If just stuck there, they, 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 they still feel good about there. Sometimes we got to be uncomfortable to get to the spot where we need to be. Like what we was talking about Job this morning. I have learned through my life when I am weak, he is strong, which makes me strong. Because when the worst times of my life, when I was at my weakest, God was there and I was the strongest. And when we start to realize that, you go, man, I know this. I know we can beat this thing. Come on. Now, who's playing football today? I'm going to watch it uh, San Francisco because that dude's straight up Christian. I'm pulling for that one. Maybe the other guy is, but I like the story. But is San Francisco on who? Eagles. Eagles? Well, I like Jalen Hurt, too, so I don't know. Maybe I don't care who wins, but I'd like to see that guy win. win. But... If the quarterback got up there and the other 10 guys wasn't wanting to play, what do you think their chances of winning was, would be? Not much. It takes a team effort to achieve victory. And what I'm trying to say, as a church body, when we get all the players playing, focused on the right mission, it's going to blow people's doors. It's going to blow minds. It's going to make people go, well, you know what? I want to go to that church. Might be some high school uh, kid that, that maybe don't have a father or mother and never been shown love. Maybe they're chasing things like this group did with video we just seen. Say, well, you know what? There's something different about that church over there. See, it ain't a one man show. It is a one man show through Jesus Christ, but it takes everybody to do it. Not just the pastor, not just the song leader, not just Brother Mo. It takes everybody, but it takes the love to bond that together. You know what? The devil's going to try and bust that apart. Yes. I've been saying it, and 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 I've been talking it, and I've been trying to be prepared, trying to warn this and that. Here's where I'm at. You know what the devil's going to do, what he's going to do, God's going to do what he's going to do, and here's the thing, maybe God trying to make it a little more pure. Mm -hmm. Think about that. Mm -hmm. So whatever happens, happens. But it ain't going to be happening because of my neglect. And hopefully not your neglect. So think about that. Think about that. <coughs> But having to follow my note for three days a day because he worked on me hard on this one. Guess what? Romans 5 8. But God demonstrated his own love toward us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You know what? 
even though I was wretched, jacked up, stumped, rotten with sin, corrupt with sin, he's died he, for me anyway. That's one reason I don't give up on people. I might put somebody on the shelf for a little while and say, well, you know what, I can't do nothing with him right now. I got a buddy I'm doing that with right now. But I'll come back to him. If that's God's will. You see what I'm saying? Because it comes a time when we just can't do it. But we still got to love them enough anyway. That makes sense? We don't close the door on people. We don't give up on people because he didn't give up on me. And I want to tell you, I know my story. So think about that. They deserve our love too. I don't care what they look like. Now, you know, I'm into what I'm into. People are into what they into. I don't see the purpose of shooting a 50 millimeter shell through your load, but people get into that. It's called games, right? I don't mock fun of that. I don't laugh at them about that. I try to stir up a conversation about that. He always gets a way in. People are into different things. Never will forget, great outdoor disciples fixing to start some stuff coming up this year. And uh, I think it's going to do awesome. But I had a parent come up to me one time. We was fishing, hunting, camping, this and And says, well, you need to do something on skateboarding. I was like, if I ever rode a skateboard in my life, I'd kill myself, break my neck. I don't know nothing about skateboards. And I said, I go, you? He said, yeah, our kids do it all the time. And I said, well, you need to come help out and start a skateboard thing now. Mm -hmm. I don't know nothing. I'm staying off of them. <laughs> oh, <come on. laughs> see, see what I'm saying? Right. Everybody has a different life. Well, guess what? Brother Moe is outdoor guy. He don't. You don't know nothing about knitting a, or crocheting a blanket or something, do you? Please say no. <laughs> <laughs> see, so I'm not gonna go up to my brother Moe and say, "Hey, will you show me?" What? Am I saying that right, crochet? Yeah. Yes. Okay. I'm not going to go up to Brother Moe and say, hey, I need to teach you how to crochet. You see what I'm saying? That makes sense? It does. So it's the same way. We can share God's word no matter where, but we need to start meeting them at their place. One of the church's biggest problem is we wait for people coming in the door and it ain't happening. And you know what? The funny thing about it is, and then some of the brothers is talking about it, in Clarksville, they doing that and their church is just I mean, it's been filled with Jesus people. But we got to go where he's seen. I'm just being real with you. This is stuff the Lord's been showing me all week long. And get this, uh, John 13, 35. If somebody turn and read that, please. And I hope you've got this memorized. But this, this to me is kind of the rallying call or who we are, who we're supposed to be. Uh, yeah, some people's hard to love. But guess what? You got to learn to love them anyway. If somebody read that, John 13, 35, and listen to the words in this. By this all people will know that you are my disciples. You have love for one another. Pretty cut and dry, ain't it? That means we got to love people that's different than us. Yes. Not like us. Yes. Oh, that's what church is. He reaches out to those who need love. Remember Cat Head when he talks about cell phones? Went by and seen that other day. Talks about it all the time. You know, you can rap. It's, if love is cell phone, you could wrap that around yourself as much as you want to to make it look like love. But until you rip that off and they say it cover from here, it's not the kind of love Jesus had. Does that make sense? Because there's a superficial love like there's a superficial faith. Make sense? So that kind of being said, we got to this point. God does a pretty good job keeping me in check. I realize I was on death row and 
and headed quickly toward death row to the end. Until he got a hold of me in my heart. He didn't get a piece, he got a hold. This song I'm fixing to play, y'all know it. It's a favorite. It just started last Monday when I was with Karen Michelle to therapy. This hit. This is where this whole message started. So I'm going to play this right after this. <coughs> Got me connected, Kevin. got to go through them one time, two times, three times, you see who Jesus is. See, it's all about the red letters. See, I don't know about you, but 
I never did go to church to get entertained or made to feel good. Always looked at church as a place where broken people come to get fixed and where the saints get equipped to go out and do God's work. That's what church, the church is. And it's up to you as an individual to seek that or not because guess what? One of these days, and kind of show you, I didn't even see that this morning. Darla said she had PowerPoint ready or whatnot. So as I sat down back there and looked up, I seen that. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. You notice that little cross? Those crosses are special to people. 33 cents a piece, 33 and a half cents a piece, I think is what I figured it up. We got a bunch of the house, get max on. Maybe we need to start adding them crosses out again. Maybe that'll build you up. See what I'm saying? So with that kind of being said, you're either going to live for yourself or you're going to live for Jesus. It ain't no fool. And I'm not buying the American way of, hey, I said this prayer, I know Jesus and this and that. Because guess what? If you truly know Jesus, he's going to transform you from the inside out. There's no stopping that. There's a power in that. He puts a fire in your heart. And I'm going to tell you something. This world we live in, this country we live in, has a way of throwing wet logs on your fire. Stay away from people like that. I'm just telling you. Stay on fire, stay read up in God's word and study those red letters if you really want to find out who Jesus was and if you really want to do the will of the Father because I'm going to tell you something and I'm done. For whatever reason, the last year, year and a half, man, it's just like the Lord just keeps pushing and keeps pushing. And I'm like, Lord, you know, I've done this, I've said this, I've preached this. No matter where it goes, it's the same message. But it all comes down to this. People want to disguise how corrupt and how much sin and how evil it is. Guess what? We're even in some churches they're accepting sin in just because it's popular. I'm going to tell you something. There will be an end one day. So we can either choose to follow Jesus right now and do God's will, or you can keep living in your will. But here's the thing. The Bible verse, to me, it's the freakiest, scariest Bible verse ever. When he says, Lord, Lord, I cast out demons in your name, prophesied in your name. And he's talking to a church person right there. And Jesus is going to look at him and say, hey, I never knew you. Proven. Coming to church, don't say to you, Jesus does. See what I'm saying? Your staff Bob, uh, I told Michelle, I said, see, we always doing stuff and we, we, we do quite a bit. And I might have said this last week because of another biker club got together, but I got contacted this week again. I want to set biker club, want to help people. It's two one center clubs in two weeks that is reaching out trying to help people. Anybody can be good. Being good is not going to get done. Jesus is the only way you're going to get it done. If you're here today with every head bowed, with every eye closed, we'll close it out this way. If you're here today and you need a relationship with Jesus Christ and you've never had that, Will you please just take the time to, to, to come up right now. Everybody's looking down. Nobody looking around. And hey, <coughs> just tell me what's on your heart. Because I'm going to tell you something. I feel like the Holy Spirit's talking to people in this church today. Don't lose your chance, your ticket. Brother Billy said an invitation when the Holy Spirit starts working on your heart and he starts changing you, the old devil's going to say, no, don't do that. He did the same thing with me. If you're here today and you feel like, you know what, you need to know Jesus, you realize you're a sinner heading to hell, 
And if you want to weigh out that ticket, that ticket's through Jesus. Guess what? You can get that today, and you can walk out those doors, and we'll get through talking, and feel good about a new life. So there's a lot of people that I'm starting to find out, and I think about this church. Uh, there's a lot of people that still wrapped up in chains. They still broken. They still jacked up. They still caged up. But then there's people that, that, that come from families without love and all this other stuff. Guess what? We need to be telling who Jesus was. So if you're here today, you need Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. Please don't leave here today without talking to me about it. And if you got something on your mind today, hey, talk about it. But I'm going to put you like this. God only blesses those that bless him. Does that make sense? Because we, we ain't smarter than God. We ain't going to slick willy up to God. God knows each one of our hearts. Now, pray for each other. Pray for this church. Pray for people outside of the church. And hey, you know what? It's open season on souls. We can hunt souls 24 7, 365 days in a year. Because we're in a soul searching business just like Jesus was. He came to seek and save that which was lost. And I hope this message really gets to our heart today to kind of keep us on focus. Because the devil's always way. And, and last thing I want to say, last thing I'm saying, this church. I love this church. I'm proud of this church. I'm proud of what people do in this church. But it's kind of like I can't help it. I was taught, hey, don't ever cut the heat back. Just build the heat up higher. Build the fire up higher and it'll never go out. And I hope we do that. And I think we will. Let's pray for this spring, March. We got some stuff going on in March and we'll try to get a men's Bible outdoor men's group going. I've had some express some desires about some young people stuff and I hope it stays lit. But remember this, commitment. It's all about commitment. What's most important? My life or his life. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you this day. We just thank you for your love. We just thank you for everything you do for us, dear Father God. We just lift up the ones in the church that's fighting illness and surgeries and those that are sick and those that are not here, dear Father God. We just want to lift you up and glorify your name. Just give us the strength. Just give us the wisdom and knowledge, dear Father God, to go out and, and live that life you created for us to live. Dear Heavenly Father, just plant it in each one of our hearts as we walk out that door today. Hey, we are a child of God. We just love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 All right, prayer request. Everybody good?